Welcome, everyone. Happy September. Um, welcome to the International Humanistic Management Association Intellectual Shaman Discussion Series with Sandra Waddick and today Chris Laszlo. Welcome to Chris, especially. Um, and thanks for joining us today. We'll be talking today with Chris about his journey to flourishing with an excursion into perspective theorizing. I uh, can't wait to hear more about that. I'll be posting some um, information in the chat just so everyone has it and I'll repost it a few times as people join so they can access the chat. Um, just very briefly, uh, I'd like to welcome also the new president of the US Humanistic Management Association, PJ Dillon is here. We had a refresh on our officer team, um, which is exciting. Um, so PJ, welcome. And we also have Michael Pearson here, who's a founder of the International Humanistic Management Association. Just briefly, Michael, are you available to say a quick welcome? He may not be available because he is shepherding children on the I, first day yes, of school. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm happy to say welcome. <laughs> I am shepherding my kids through first days of middle school and, and elementary school and, and different orientation programs. So I apologize, but excited for all of you to join. Welcome to the world. It's exciting to see where you're all from and the time that you're making the commitment that you're making. So, and thank you to Sandra, Chris and Erica. Back to you. Wonderful, thank you. So with that, I'm going to focus my attention on posting information in the chat and I'm going to turn it over to Sandra uh, to formally welcome Chris and everyone. Well, thank you. Thank you, Erica. And thank you, Michael and PJ. Welcome. Um, and welcome to everyone uh, who's joining us today. Uh, it's really exciting to be starting the series off this year with Chris Laszlo. Um, and I'm just going to briefly introduce Chris. And what we thought we'd do is um, have talk with Chris for I will I'll ask him a few questions and he'll tell us about his journey and if you have questions as he speaks please put them into the chat and Erica and I will monitor the chat and try to pull out some relevant questions so that we can um, get you involved too and and then um, for the last 20 or 15 minutes Chris will talk about prospective theorizing if we don't get to it during the regular course of the conversation but first let me tell you a little bit of background um, uh, 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 first about the, the this series this is really meant to be kind of a uh, developmental orientation thinking about people's careers and lives and how they got to where they are and the kinds of ideas they've been grappling with over the course of their careers um, so you can ask any kinds of questions of Chris that you'd like to know about his path and his journey and the kinds of ideas that he's been um, uh, dealing with for all low these many years. Let me just give you a little bit of background about him. He's professor of organizational behavior um, and the Shar and Chuck Fowler professor of business as an agent of world benefit at Case Western Reserve's Weatherhead School of Management. There he researches, researches flourishing enterprise generally. Um, he's written a total of six books, including the most recent was Quantum Leadership, Flourishing Enterprise in 2014, Embedded Sustainability in 2011, and Sustainable Value in 2008. And you can see that there's kind of a theme there. Um, in 2012, he was elected a top 100 thought leader in trustworthy business behavior by Trust Across America. And he's known for his work on sustainability and flourishing enterprise. He's held a distinguished visiting scholar appointment at Benedictine University multiple times and is senior fellow at the Peter F. Drucker and Masatoshi Ito Graduate School of Management at Claremont Graduate University. Um, he's also a member of the International Academy of Management and incoming chair for the Management, Spirituality and Religion MSR group, interest group uh, for the Academy. Um, and he, maybe he can tell us a little bit about getting into that line of work as well. He's a partner and co-founder of Sustainable Value Partners, a strategy uh, consulting firm with senior leaders of family businesses at, and at global clients such as Bayer, Cisco, and L'Oreal. So he spent nearly 10 years as an executive at Lafarge, a world leader in building materials, where he was head of strategy, general man manager of, of manufacturing, subsidiary, and vice president of business development. Prior to that, he spent five years with Braxton Associates in, in Deloitte, where he consulted on strategy to global business leaders. He holds his doctorate 
in economics and management from the University of Paris and graduate degrees from Columbia and an undergraduate degree from Swarthmore College. So as you can see, he's got a wide range of both interests and um, background. So Chris, you had a very interesting career, as I just detailed some of it, and have been one of the pioneers in management scholarship to think about issues of sustainability, sustain, particularly sustainable value, and and with the emphasis on flourishing enterprise. Can you tell us a little bit about how you how you came to this and what and how you came to embark on this particular journey? Absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you, Sandra. First of all, for that very warm uh, and too, too lengthy, too detailed welcome, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I just want to say it's a real pleasure to be here and to be here with so many friends and colleagues and people that I admire, um, students and uh, people who have influenced me. I well, There are many among you here who um, have really contributed a lot to me. And um, I also want to say, uh, Sandra, it's been about 20 years since we first met uh, to discuss sustainability and uh, just how much I've enjoyed our collaborate, uh, many collaborations since then, and the influence that you have had on me. Okay, well, I wanna say right at the start that uh, the title of this webinar, My Journey to Flourishing, is not meant to suggest somehow that I've arrived at the state of flourishing, okay? Um, it's really not an end state. It's a work in progress, a daily effort to be well, to live life to the fullest. And that's really the sense in which I want to speak about this journey. So uh, Sandra, to your question, you know, how did I get into, the, into this really? I, I think in some ways I had a, um, a uh, moment of uh, understanding about what I wanted to do in high school. You know, I first realized really, uh, I forget it was my first or second year in high school that I wanted to do something meaningful to make a positive impact on the world around me. And that doing that uh, would be central to my own sense of flourishing in life. So a, a pivotal moment, and I related this to you, Sandra, yesterday, and we had a good laugh about it because at age 16, I somehow got roped into giving a speech to my fellow students, you know, 250 students plus faculty and staff. And I was telling Santa that wasn't really the right thing to do if you wanted to be, you know, a cool, cool with your fellow students. Normally it was only faculty and staff that gave these talks. They would go up on a, on a uh, stage and give five or 10 minutes talk on a topic and then we would sit in silence. But somehow or other, uh, I don't remember, I, I want to say I got roped in, but at that immature age, I probably volunteered. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I spoke about the need to make the world a better place and uh, about helping people in developing countries. You know, back then the issue was uh, intergovernmental debt and the austerity measures that that imposed on people. And uh, so I just remember feeling during that talk, uh, that I was doing something that had a real meaning uh, to me, that, that engaging people in this greater social purpose was something that had particular significance for me, that it gave a sense to what I wanted to do with my life. Now, that was age 16. Of course, I went on to you know, do studies like we all, we all do to, from, from uh, high school and onwards. And after graduate studies, I took a more traditional path. I joined a strategy consulting practice, as, as Sandra mentioned, uh, Braxton, which became part of Deloitte, and then these 10 years with this Fortune 500 company. And I was doing what a lot of my friends were, were trying to do at the time, which was climbing the corporate ladder and you know, trying to make my mark in the professional world. But I always felt a need to return to this one or this one central question of corporate social responsibility. So the question was, how can for-profit businesses contribute to making the world a better place? And at the time, you have to understand that it, it was mostly positioned as either or. Either you made a profit in business or business behaved ethically. But for me, the more interesting question became, how can one become successful in business and play a positive role in society without trade-offs? So about 25 years ago, I decided to devote myself more or less full time 
to researching and practice in this area. And uh, that's and uh, the, out of that uh, work in 2003 came my first book, actually, The Sustainable Company, which was published in 2003 by Island Press. And um, I also, that was the year I co-founded uh, the firm that uh, Sandra mentioned, sustainable, uh, co-founded <coughs> Sustainable Value Partners. Um, and also around that time, I began to teach a new course, Sustainability for Business Advantage at the European Business School, INSEAD, um, in their executive ed program. Okay, so that's kind of where, that, that's sort of the, the, that background up to really uh, the point at which I um, was decided to teach, research, and be of service in academia. So how did that happen? Well, in 2005, really completely out of the blue, I got a call from a fellow by the name of David Cooperwriter, who uh, at Case Western Reserve University, who had read my book, The Sustainable Company, and he wanted to know if I could come to the Weatherhead School at Case to give a talk in an executive ed workshop. And that led to me joining the faculty at Case. And then ever since then, you know, teaching these courses, uh, again, that Sandra mentioned on, on sustainability, flourishing, and then and quantum leadership. Um, one thing, you know, that I, and I, please do post questions and, you know, I'm happy to make this as interactive as uh, we want. One comment that I would invite Sandra, you to add to, um, and any others as well, is I was reflecting on how much the landscape has changed in the last 20 years for topics such as climate change or um, social justice issues. Uh, it's just amazing, you know, 20 years ago, uh, when, you, when we were teaching uh, this topic and, and brought up climate change in business schools or in executive ed in, in corporate universities, it was really viewed as a hundred year impacts would be 100, had a hundred year horizon. And maybe, you know, by 2010, we were starting to talk about 2050 as being, you know, when we would have, have uh, be looking at impacts that we, we needed to really uh, adapt to or, or really be concerned about mitigating in the shorter term. And now suddenly here we are in 2021, and I realize this may not be true for every country in the world. So there may be parts of the world where uh, you don't have climate change effects uh, like we do, for example, in the United States, in Japan, in, um, in uh, Europe. Uh, there are many parts of the world where um, it's, it, it, it truly is a, uh, something that is very present today. And also the ex degree to which um, student awareness and executive awareness has changed is encouraging. You know, um, 20 years ago, I was often, um, I was, I got a lot of pushback from students and, and, and executives in these training programs who would say to me, what does this have to do with business? Why, why are you teaching about, you know, our impact on the environment uh, for business. Uh, it doesn't belong in a general management program. I, I really had sort of systematic pushback from many people. And um, today, you know, I was just reflecting last week in teaching undergraduates, um, there's a sort of a, a, a really deep universal and fairly sophisticated understanding of climate change, its origins and uh, the need for business to tackle this as part of its, um, of, of how it does uh, business. So Sandra or, or Erica, are there questions here before we go? I'd like to talk also about how my journey differed from the conventional way, uh, Sandra, but. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get back. I wanted to just push you a little bit because yeah. you mentioned CSR. And uh, as you know, um, I studied CSR for a long time and so did yeah. you, but. Um, you also have talked about sustainable value and flourishing enterprises. So it seems to me that you moved far away from CSR considered as kind of the do good programs that companies uh, engage in. Uh, um, can you talk a little bit about that, that sort of shift towards looking at the actual business models of companies? Sure. So um... I feel like I was part of a 
uh, I feel like I was part of a broader movement that Sandra, you were part of, and many others here uh, on this uh, webinar were also part of, which was uh, a emerging consensus that business had to move from seeing environmental and social uh, issues as being just constraints to business or questions about you know, government uh, um, regulation and then public relations kind of things to uh, a business, uh, to integrating it into the business in a doing less harm mode. So let me explain what I mean by that. So uh, CSR was often this thing that was parallel to the core business, as many of you know, and did not have a line management um, reporting to any of the uh, C-suites that ran the business. It was sometimes stuck under HR or you know, communications or something like that. And, and then it, suddenly, I think in the 2000s, uh, we started to see businesses say, hey, you know, we can save money. We can reduce our costs. We can reduce our risks. We can differentiate our products. And so that led to this idea that businesses can pursue profit and by reducing harm to society and the environment, it was going to be um, a um, uh, good for business and uh, good for society. And that's really where I think, Sandra, this is your point. We, we, many of us started shifting this into the notion of value creation. This wasn't just about when I say just about ethics, it's extremely important that we think about this in terms of ethical behavior. I don't want to diminish the importance of wanting business leaders and the institution of business to be ethical. Absolutely. But to speak in their language, we also were helped by the ability to show business leaders that they were able to um, do well and do good. And then, uh, you know, John Ehrenfeld in 2008 and then in 2013 with his student, Andy Hoffman, who I know you've interviewed recently, Sandra, in this series, um, they really recast the whole challenge as one of going from doing less harm to flourishing, meaning that the role of business now is not just to make money while, do, while you know, being less unsustainable. It's really about how businesses can uh, contribute to human well-being, to regenerative natural environments, to prosperity in the communities that they work in. Thanks, Chris. Um, so let's go back to your journey a little bit. How, how, has your, how would you say your journey has differed from the, the sort of the normal academic path, the, the one that, um, that uh, many of us follow? We go from doctoral programs into academia and stay there. But you came in from the corporate world and, um, and had followed a really different kind of path. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I, I do want to share that with you in, in the spirit of, you know, encouraging those of you that may also be thinking about unconventional approaches or doing it your own way, you know, get there to make impact your own way. And so I, that's been very much uh, kind of how I approach things. And um, as Sandra is saying, you know, besides uh, coming from the corporate world, rather than directly from graduate studies, I also did a number of things uh, that were against conventional wisdom in academia. So first, first, okay, I've been more interested in social impact than in high impact factor research. So you'll recognize those, those terms, meaning that I always wanted my work to be read widely by practitioners rather than narrowly by academics. And I realized that to, to, to move forward in a, a traditional academic career, you have to be read narrowly by academics to be able to get tenure. So, you know, that posed a, a number of challenges. Um, and uh, it's also one of the reasons I started writing books and only uh, later journal articles, because uh, what, what, I was, what I was publishing um, was probably or was, was not something that the top journals would have been willing to publish and what I was writing in those early years because it was really directed in a prospective sense at having social impact about bringing a particular kind of reality into existence. Um, 
to, I also have to say, and I, there are many students on the call here, and I want to say, you know, to publish in academic journals, I have to learn methods of qualitative and quantitative research that my PhD in economics just hadn't prepared me for. And I actually owe a lot to not just my colleagues, but to many doctoral students who helped teach me these basic research methods or showed me the, the, uh, how to do this kind of research. And many of these doctoral students are here today. So thank you to, to, to all of you. Um, in a second, second way that was quite different is scholars are often, and I ask you if you feel this is the case for you, we're often encouraged to stay in our lane. You know what I mean by that? Like we, we, we're supposed to be working within a narrowly defined discipline. And I always felt that the complex social and global issues in management, in management research and practice, made it different from other disciplines on which it's based, like um, sociology or psychology or um, anthropology, uh, economics, and, and, and so on. So um, I wanted to take a much more inter or transdisciplinary approach. And in fact, I went much further afield than would normally be seen as wise, meaning that I drew also on the natural sciences, as some of the, the, the natural sciences, as some of you may know, um, to research and write about the implications, for example, of the quantum physics uh, paradigm uh, and the, 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 the implications of quantum physics for how we look at the world. Okay, then third, another sort of time-honored principle I avoided <laughs> was um, scientific objectivity. At, at least in the sense of uh, scientific objectivity that requires the researcher to adopt a, a, what is sometimes called an impersonal view from nowhere. That the researcher should not bring any of their own perspectives, biases, uh, they, you know, that they, they should not influence in any way um, this, uh, this, uh, the study of the research. Well, I got. Uh, I want to share with each of you that I, uh, in fact, did bring my own perspectives and experiences to my research and writing. And here's a couple of things that actually tie over to MSR, to spirituality and research. Um, I trusted my intuition and sensing and presencing and believed that they were more than just gut, uh, what do they call it? gut um, feelings or hunches. Um, I believe that they are skills that you can cultivate through practice and that they, that um, these other ways of knowing are conduits to intellectual creativity, to insights and to solutions to difficult problems. Um, so, uh, and, and they're also foundational to perspective theorizing, which I'll talk about later. So uh, just consider one, one thing. Um, many of you, I assume, have a very rough familiarity with some of the key features of quantum physics, or at least the, the implications of quantum physics, okay? Um, I believe that these so-called other ways of knowing that the academy usually frowns on can help us understand aspects of quantum reality. So we can intuitively experience what quantum physics physicists call superposition, entanglement, and non-locality. So through spiritual or religious practice, we can have an experience of the essential oneness of reality and its wholeness and interconnectedness, which the early quantum physicists were very clear, you know, was, was the world described by their empirical experiments. Um, so what did it mean for me? Like, how did I do that? Well, one of my lifelong practices has been running, you know, basically for my whole life, it was what I, what I did because it was just part of it, I guess. But until about 10 years ago, I often ran mindlessly, meaning that when I ran, I was preoccupied with, you know, what did I do wrong yesterday and what challenges do I have tomorrow? And, um, and uh, so I could run, you know, for some period of time and not even realize where I was or, or what, what, what experience I'd had. But then I became more intentional and started running, uh, ch choosing where I went running. So running through with the trails um, and being more present in the moment. And um, 
I, I'm, I hope I can say this in a group of scholars like this and not, not that this isn't uh, something people will laugh at, but communicating with the trees while I ran, okay? <laughs> um, so running, running became an exercise uh, in nature immersion. And it's not only for fitness or to calm myself, and it also became, and here's the key thing for all you scholars, creative scholars, these kind of practices, and please choose your own, it doesn't have to be running, these kind of practices are a way to get insights into research questions that you wouldn't normally have access to, or at least that was the, that was the case for me. So under the right conditions, running helps me download new ideas, insights, and solve thorny problems. In other words, in short, mindful running has made me a better scholar. Okay. <laughs> it's funny because when I started thinking about shamanic practice, I, um, I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to just totally derail my career. And it, you know, it, it had the absolute opposite effect. One more question before we turn to some of the uh, questions, and we have some great questions coming from listeners, so um, I want to turn some time over to them. But um, I want to ask you one more question. It's got to do with the obstacles and the resistance that you encountered and where you found the courage and how you maybe recommend to others to find the courage to deal with those. So uh, I... I have experienced academia at its worst as well. You know, the, the political uh, obstacles that can be in your way, the, the heavy process, the unfairness between the uh, workloads uh, given to junior faculty versus senior faculty, um, the, um, uh, you know, this, this strong preference for a certain kind of uh, research that can be deadening. And I, I think what I resolved early on to do was to keep my focus on what was the end game? Like, what's the thing that I really want? What was the purpose for what I was doing? And that always kept me um, going, even in times when I was very discouraged. So there were times I was very discouraged early on. And, but I, I also had this um, I had this sense that this uh, com commitment to business as a force for good, uh, I don't, and I don't know why, Sandra, I'm not sure I could tell you why I had this deep belief that continuing to work on that was going to make a difference. So, and, you know, I, I, I also on occasion um, wrote a book or taught a class or gave a talk when I didn't feel I really knew completely what I, what I was saying from a good scholarly perspective. <laughs> and that takes courage. Um, so let me uh, see if Katrin um, Heuscher, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, thank you so much, Sandra. And uh, thank you very much for, for the insights, um, Chris. Um, so what I was wondering, as you also mentioned that so much has, has changed and the importance of, of certain people along your journey, um, what's the advice that you would give junior people who are just on that, on that journey and, and finding their way? Um, and also, how do you think that changed in comparison to 20 years ago um, in terms of what we're, the reality we're navigating right now? Thank you. Thank you, Katrin. What, having mentors is obviously very important. And I don't know if this is the complete sense in which you were asking this question, but one thing that I feel is very different today than 20 years ago is there was, um, for a number of reasons, a heavy reliance on um, senior white, Western educated male scholars. And, um, I think that uh, fortunately that really has changed. It's not changed enough. In many places, it's still limiting, but there, there is something now in, in the halls of academia that I sense is a really fundamental shift. And it's, I'm in so many conversations about this um, in the executive leadership group for, for the management of spirituality and religion. 
effort um, in my department, uh, at my university, at, uh, in corporate clients. So if you can find mentors who are um, rep represent the diversity of gender, of um, you know, culture, of, uh, of all the different dimensions, I think that is uh, really helpful in terms of getting the support you need in a world that wants to move into that direction. Um, so I, I, would you mind, can you just uh, follow up uh, to what I said? Is that what you were looking for or are you, were there other aspects that you were specifically asking about? That, that's a brilliant response. And I'm, the way I'm thinking about it in my mind right now is kind of having a sounding board of who we would want the voices in, in academia to be and, um, and, and bringing that forward um, also collectively because it doesn't have to be so lonely. Right. Um, so thank you very much for, for that response. Okay. I just want to add that in my early career, uh, the people who made the biggest difference for me were Bertrand Colon, who was a... Um, uh, uh, this, you know, larger than life leader from uh, of, who was the chair, chairman and CEO of Lafarge and David Cooper Ryder and, um, you know, uh, several others um, in the early phase. More recently, I just want to acknowledge besides, um, uh, besides Sandra, um, Julia, <laughs> Julia Storberg Walker and uh, Judy Neal and uh, Diana Billamoria. Uh, many of you perhaps also on this call um, have, have influenced me, but it's interesting to me that the, the type of mentors that I have now are more, more international and more diverse than, than they were um, 20 years ago. So uh, Luciana Cesarino, um, do you want to uh, ask your question? You still here? Luciana? I was muted. Hi, everybody. Uh, Chris, thank you for this precious words. I just want to know how can we uh, stimulate or uh, any kind of uh, tr construct any kind of change to the mindset of the managers? Because I see a lot of difficulty in the decision-making process towards sustainability. So system thinking can open our eyes and change our decisions. So how can we as a part of academia work with this? Well, I love your question, Luciana. Thank you so much uh, for asking that because- Just let me, just let me interrupt you for a second. Are you a parent of Alexander? Yes. Alexander Laszlo? Yes, I am. He's, he's my brother. He's a very good friend of mine. No. <laughs> That's great. He's my brother. Just yes. this, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries at all. No worries. Please, well, I'll tell him that I, I um, spoke with you today. So, you know, this question you're asking about how can we uh, get people engaged in a different way, I, I understand that. You know, that's really the reason why I turned to quantum leadership, because I felt that the approaches we had taken up to that point with flourishing enterprise had two limitations. One is that they were at the team organizational systems level, which we all, we're all excited about systems change, clearly. But I felt like to get that, we also have to transform individuals at a deep level of their self-concept. So now there's a lot of emphasis. Many people have talked about mindset change, about consciousness change, and so on. So the, the, the work that I'm very interested in doing is helping um, future leaders and current leaders with uh, a, taking direct intuitive practices in their daily lives. Like, so for me, that's running with five minutes of meditation after the run. But for others, it can be, med it can be art and aesthetics. It can be music. It can be just walking in nature. Um, it can be yoga, it's many, many different things. And these practices transform their, uh, a person's consciousness. Um, and meaningful interactions with humans, absolutely. I, I just happened to see that in the chat. Uh, I, I think that that is in itself a practice. How many of us engage intentionally in high quality relationships 
not just with our loved ones, but with strangers when we have occasion to do that during the day. And when we do these practices, they transform our consciousness by giving us an experience of connectedness to others and of wholeness in the world. And I think that um, the, it's only through that kind of experience that we deeply change leaders. Because look, the cognitive case, the business case for sustainability, look, I spent 10, 15 years doing that until I was, it was coming out of my ears, okay? And it, it, I realized you only get so far with that. You get people to tackle the low-hanging fruit, but um, when you get leaders who can actually change how they are in life, change their way of being and cultivate that way of being through these practices of connectedness, as I call them, and then when you can layer on top of that a different view from the, sci from the new sciences about the nature of reality being really whole and interconnected, that can stick the people. And I've seen it stick. I've seen people then really become uh, a different kind of leader where um, they don't do things just because of a return on investment logic. They, uh, they care for people and future generations and the earth because that's simply who they are. Thanks, Chris. Um, Anil Mashwar, you spoke about your brother earlier. He, Anil has another question about family. Yes, definitely. So, Chris, uh, it's been a joy to to work with you in the last couple of years, and uh, you know, again, on, on consciousness, which you just brought out, conscious, uh, quantum, and consciousness, the interconnectedness. I was just always curious. Now, your father is doing this uh, tremendous new work on this new paradigm around consciousness space. I'm wondering how influential was he on your formative experience, and how you got into this whole idea about what you said at the age of sixteen. You gave that speech stood out and all that stuff. So what was your relationship with your father in that those days? Yes, thank you. Uh, you might you might just say who your father is. Just okay, sure. Yes. Yes. So um well first of all thank you Anil and it has truly been my pleasure to work with you and on some of these big seminal events that you've been doing uh, recently that have really made a difference um, to, to changing consciousness in the world. Um, my father, yes, my father, many of you may or may not know his work, uh, Irvin Laszlo. He has uh, published a lot in systems theory and in um, more recently in the new paradigm uh, based on, on the new sciences, more coming from a philosophical perspective. And of course, he's been a, a big influence uh, on me. Um, you know, other kids when they were eight, nine years old, got to go play soccer with their dad. And I got to sit in the guest bedroom listening to him talk about systems philosophy. So, you know, I'm not sure <laughs> where I ended up with my childhood experience as a father. And, you know, relationships with, with parents, our relation, each of us have a complex, I assume, relationship with our fathers. And it's true for me as well. But what I will say is that even if Irvin Laszlo had not been my father, I think I would have been influenced by his work because I find it just fits so well with you know, what, what is needed in today's world. Um, and the last thing I will say is my father is now 89 years old. He used to publish, um, write and publish a book a year. And the only thing that's changed last year and this year is now he's publishing two books a year. <laughs> um. Eldon uh, Weeby wants to take us back to the question of uh, profitability trade-offs. Eldon, you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. Um, you know, it's funny to me that that we've gotten to a place where where we even have this trade-off kind of talk to begin with, and I wonder if there's a, you know, anyone who's done work on on kind of how those things actually diverge to begin with. And, and how, as a result, you know, the prominence of profit over literally everything um, just took such ascendancy. Um, and we somehow forgot that, you know, the very basis of our interactions is about how we care for each other and serve one another. And, and those are ethical issues. So do you know of any work that has kind of, uh, I don't know, chronicled that? That's not a good word, but uh, has, has, you know, shown us how those have uh, separated out to begin with. 
Thank you, Eldon. And yes, I think you're, it's a wonderful question and you're asking this in the right place. One of the best reference sources uh, to speak about how we got to this dominance of profit over all else is a scholar I have great respect for by the name of Sandra Waddock. <laughs> I think so, you're referring to my paper in the Humanistic Management Journal, right, Chris? Well, you've written several pieces on that. <laughs> you, didn't you just have a piece uh, in sustainability with, uh, tell us about that, Sandra, because- Oh, I have one on reframing economic values. Yeah, uh, that's that, right. That came out in sustainability um, in 2020, yeah, which I'm happy to share with anyone. I'm trying to publicize it broadly, but it posits a new, six new principles. Uh, values that we we might put at the core of economics and i'm working with a global team called gain the global assessment for a new economics which has developed 10 principles and hopefully we will soon be trying to publish those um, so yeah happy to share that with anyone um, so chris i have a question for you um, yeah. it's about 20 of if you want to talk about prospective theorizing that's great but i can tell you there's a ton of great questions so it's up to no. you I, I think we should go with the questions, but why don't we go with what, and I can try to weave in a little bit of perspective theorizing uh, if there's an opportunity um, to, through the questions, but the more conversational, the more I think it could be uh, a, a rich way to spend the remaining time. Okay, so Bill, um, Prince, oh uh, yeah, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> That's good enough, Sandra. <laughs> Great, thank you. Hey, thank you for taking this question, Chris. Uh, Chris, I've been in the, uh, let me just start off by saying my mission in life has been to bring more consciousness to the business world, okay? I've been in business for well over 50 years. I've started my own companies, four of my own companies. I've been consulting now for at least 10 years for many companies. At the same time, I've been in the world of consciousness for well over 50 years, almost going into that full time and letting go of my business. But in my meditations, the message was integrate the two. Uh, so at this point in my life, uh, I'm just completing a book uh, with uh, Dr. Farias. Uh, it's titled right now, uh, Improvisational Leadership. It talks about all the consciousness principles, meditation, mindfulness, including improvisation, which I also do, and how it can be applied to business. So now I'm basically coming out into the world, and that's got to be my new consulting. Uh, I've tried several, I'm thinking of several different ways to do it, and with your experience of having and seeing that, what do you suggest is the best way for me to introduce this? Well, uh, are you interested to introduce this into the mainstream of business or are you looking for just, uh, well, I don't mean just, but you know, there will always be people at the fringes or in, let's say in niche businesses mm -hmm. where they are much more open to this, but are you, I think that, that's a big choice. Interesting, okay. Well, it, it sounds like the latter might be an easier entree. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I'd like, uh, I, as I said, based on your experience, I'm wondering where you feel it's most effective and, and where we can be. So it sounds like the latter is what you, you might be thinking about. Well, I, I've always been interested in trying to reach mainstream mm -hmm. uh, uh, folks, people who are not a dead set against uh, business playing a role as agent of world benefit, who are not dead set against the idea that uh, transforming consciousness is the highest point of leverage, as Donnell and Meadows said. But um, still, how do we reach the mainstream? And there, sort of in, in a nutshell, what I found was that you do have to start with the business case in the sense you have to show them that doing well, um, doing well does not have to uh, be at the, uh, uh, a trade-off with doing good. In other words, uh, companies can do well by doing good. Is what I'm trying to say. Um, so you have to you have to show that, and you have to show very specifically how uh, environmental ESG, what's called ESG now, can create. And it's, it's relatively easy to do, Bill, because there's so much good data now that didn't exist 20 years ago, showing that ESG has a statistically significant alpha for companies that focus on materially significant. ESG issues and don't focus on immaterial issues. Mm -hmm. um, once you do that, then you can move into 
well, just doing less harm is not enough. Flourishing is where future expectations are going. And from there you can go into, or I found in my experience, from there you can go into this question about mindset and you know the, the paradigmatic assumptions that people hold about how the world works and, and about human nature. And Donella Meadows is an excellent, I mean, I, it's, she wrote these papers in 97 and 1999, not in, in an academically recognized journal, but I think they are fantastic pieces on places to intervene in the system where she put mindset change at the top. And so uh, to wrap it up, to wrap up the answer, it's you start where they are, you reassure them that they can continue to be successful as business people. Uh, going down this path to try to be more of an agent of world benefit. And you then in conversation with them, get to where they discover that consciousness uh, transformation and the practices that can lead to transformation consciousness can be critical. Thank you, Chris, appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. This is a kind of a follow-up question that Joel Harmon had posed. Joel, you wanna ask your question? Uh, thank you, Sandra, <clears throat> and, and thank you, Chris, for a, a career of contribution that's uh, been, been so uh, enjoyable and helpful. I, I actually think that you probably answered my question, which was, uh, you know, concerning the uh, woeful inadequacy, even hypocrisy um, in, in large from business and how reluctant they generally, the business community seems to be, to become powerful public advocates for the kind of deep system change. I imagine that you would point to this uh, need to change the mindfulness, uh, the consciousness of the leaders increasingly to get to some kind of critical mass where they would begin to tackle that for business. I, I assume that's how you would answer that. Is that true? Yes. Yes, Joel. And by the way, it's been a pleasure working with you on, on past projects as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's good to be back in touch. But yes, I think that's right. It's it, it's unlikely to get change through just cognitive, rational, empirical persuasion. Yeah. So thanks. Uh, Carrie, I don't know if your eyes. It says you're on your phone. Can you ask one of your questions? Sure. Sorry, I'm just not really camera ready right now, but. <laughs> Um, it's nice to see you, Chris, and I forgot where they are. Let's see. Well, I think one was about management education and, or education writ large. And, you know, is it time to tackle the business model of education, um, or redesign it? So in service to a regenerative future, because my sense is that as somebody who's navigated both worlds, uh, you have really important perspectives to share on that. Because the management education particularly has not caught up to the needs of our, the, the needs of humanity to transform. Yes, yes. And, you know, here again, Sandra has written great stuff, but so has um, um, Rimenoshi, uh, Sandra, I'm blocking her first name. Um, R oh, no, Isabel, Isabel. Yeah, I'm sorry, Isabel. Isabel Rimenoshi is doing really good work in this area also with the mind, uh, sustainability mindset indicators. You might look at that. But Sandra, do you want to say a few words about some, some of the things? That, and we published one paper on uh, a couple of years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. Change. Torn between two paradigms paper. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I sort of agree that business schools in particular are kind of hopeless at this point. Um, and, and like businesses, they're not going to shift until the ecosystem around them demands that they shift in a, in a whole variety of ways. And that includes the accrediting bodies and student demand and uh, mindset change among faculty who are often locked into their paradigms. So it's, it's, it's kind of a difficult road to haul, uh, to haul I think. Um, PJ, you had a, a question for Chris. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Um, one of the questions I had was about, you know, what are some of the key quantum concepts you see connecting with flourishing or potentially transcendence? And are these things that can be addressed in our current uh, situation in the OB world? Um, and what methodologies do you see helping us kind of connect to that? 
So uh, the way to start with those, bec just because they seem so esoteric to people, is to start with experiential learning, uh, or in my is, is how I've approached it. So if you, I, I teach a class on quantum leadership at Case Western, it's primarily for graduate students, uh, some, some uh, seniors of undergraduates, but mostly graduate students from various schools, including the medical school, the law school, the management school. And we start every class with a practice, a, a practice of connectedness. So over 15 classes and the students actually um, carry out the practice. They engage the rest of the class in the practice. Uh, and I tell them, don't don't uh, tell the class about the practice, have the class do the practice right at the start. So the class does a practice, okay? It can be uh, art and aesthetics, you know, or practice like Zentangle, it can be chair yoga, or we go outside for a walk in nature, or um, we've had, um, you know, music and, uh, 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 of course, mindfulness meditation, body scan, uh, anyway, a, a wide range of different things that the choose, students choose. Now, over time, what we do is we debrief every week and people uh, are asked to uh, authentically, you know, sh or share uh, what their experience is of these practices. And throughout, they are also journaling. And the goal here is for people to get themselves into a place where they do start experiencing greater oneness and connectedness and coherence. And then we can, and then we can talk about um, the difference between the conventional science view of the world, you know, the Newtonian, Cartesian uh, uh, world, uh, and then the neoclassical uh, Jevons and so on, that saw the world as fundamentally uh, uh, separate, uh, isolated, made up of clumps of matter that sort of uh, float around an empty space subject to these laws like gravity and the electromagnetic field um, and the strong and, and weak nuclear forces. But that, that's kind of a deadening world. It's a world, you know, where we, life is kind of meaningless and we're um, in, in, uh, in a material positivist material world. It's not surprising that people have built from that, you know, on top of that, they've built the utility maximization, uh, survival of the fittest, um, you know, and uh, other, um, other conclusions about the, the nature and aims of, of human behavior in society that are separating us and that are leading to a um, leading to fragmentation and to tribalism and so on. Now, um, to go back to this class with these practices, if, you, if we can understand what quantum physics is actually telling us about the nature of reality, we see it's diametrically opposite to the conventional science approach. We see that uh, the findings, empirical findings, not hypotheses, empirical findings of quantum physics are that uh, the world exists more in terms of a potential, what's called superposition state, and that the act of observation collapses a, that potential into an actuality. And that uh, at, the, at the quantum level, we are deeply interconnected, even across great distances, which is the notion of entanglement. Um, and you know, non-locality, which actually came later in, in quantum physics uh, with the Bell theorem experiment showed that, that particles that are paired can stay paired over great distances uh, and uh, appear to violate the limit of the speed of light uh, in terms of how fast they, they uh, stay uh, connected when one change, the other changes. So all of this is to say, uh, I may have gone a little bit, bit far here, but what I'm trying to say is that you need to give people an experience of wholeness and connectedness, and then you need to give them a frame from science about the nature of reality to help them make sense of that experience. And I'm still experimenting with that. I'm not saying this is that I have the, the truth about how to do any of this, 
I'm trying to um, see how that combination of direct intuitive uh, practices that give you an experience of wholeness and connectedness and that are re that's then reframed by the findings from quantum science allows people to say, okay, I'm actually, I see the world differently now. So let me push on that. Judy Neal has a question, I think, that relates to perspective theorizing. Judy, you want to ask your question? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra and Chris, my buddies. <laughs> it's great to be with you. Um, yeah, my, my question is about AOM as a system. And Chris, and it's, it's an appreciative inquiry question. What changes do you see in the Academy of Management at, that really support the sustainability mindset that support us as a community, a scholarly community moving towards flourishing and that support, and I know you haven't really talked about perspective theorizing, but I think it's a breakthrough way of thinking and being. Um, so what's happening in the academy? Any evidence for support of perspective theorizing? So I, I, it's a wonderful question as always, uh, Judy. Um, it's it points to so many uh, rich, fruitful directions for the academy. So the extent that the academy is just studying the past and data, data-based past and present phenomena uh, and doing it for um, to elaborate theories that build on scientific merit and um, originality as defined by peers and by editors, by academy editors, that's never going to change the world the way we need it to change. We, we're reach, we've reached a point now where particularly management scholars are facing such large, complex social and global problems that as researchers, we can't just be studying these things. We actually need as researchers to shape, to influence the future of the, these phenomena that we're studying. And perspective theorizing uh, really comes from this idea that Marty Seligman, the, the clinical psychologist, Marty Seligman uh, developed this idea that prospection is the, uh, is the taking into consideration possible futures. And that um, when we do that, when we develop images, intentions and questions about futures that we're committed to, they can then, and, Th that can then shape those futures as we study them. And so really what perspective theorizing, and I would really encourage all of you to, to look into that because perspective theorizing gives the scholar huge power. It's a kind of action research really where the questions you ask, the intentions you bring and the images about the future that you have in your mind uh, are things which will uh, shape the kind of research you do. And uh, if you bring into that furthermore, some of these other ways of knowing, and Ju Judy Neal has uh, written and talked quite a bit about these other ways of knowing, uh, of, of things like intuition and sensing and presencing, Otto Scharmer, for example, you know, his kind of work. If you bring that into serious scholarship, you have an opportunity to also think about um, new ways to uh, research and write about phenomena that are needed uh, or how we want to see phenomena evolve into the future. Thank you, Chris. Um, we are now at, we have still lots of great questions, but unfortunately I don't think we're gonna get to them because um, we are at uh, 1259 and it is time for us to wrap up. So I just wanna thank again, you in particular and everybody for listening um, and um, and for asking such great questions and um, I hope we get a chance to talk more about perspective theorizing at some point because I think that is actually a topic that uh, people might want to hear a little bit more about um, and uh, thank you to the humanistic management group Michael and Erica in particular for organizing it and PJ for leading us um, and um, and uh, we hope in two weeks, Phil Mervis will be back and he'll be talking about consciousness. So he's gonna continue this theme. So um, please come and enjoy Phil's talk in two weeks and uh, 
same kind of thing. And Chris, thank you so much. And so huge, huge thank you to Sandra, to Chris. Come for Phil Mervis's talk. We also have Greg Cayete coming in November to talk about indigenous philosophy, indigenous wisdom. Um, and this is a wonderful foundation perspective theorizing for kicking off a fruitful um, fall semester. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you all. It was great being with you all. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.